Good afternoon and thank you for joining us. My name is Anne Core and I am the Construction Market Advisor for Enterprise Ireland based in our London office. You're all very welcome today to our webinar on the UK CA mark and how it will impact on your business. The UK conformity assessment mark came into effect on the 1st of January this year and it's important that you understand what this means for your business and what you need to do to be prepared for when the CE mark is no longer recognised in England, Scotland and Wales. So before I introduce you to our panel of experts, if you have any questions throughout the webinar, please do type them into the box that you should see on the right hand side of your screen and we will cover them at the end. And also a recording of this webinar will automatically be emailed to you within the next, let's say 48 hours and will also be available on our website. But now I'd like to introduce our panel. I'm going to start off with Kevin Belson, who is a technical manager for the United Kingdom Accreditation Service, Sidan Sahani, Global Regulatory Analyst at Compliance and Risks, Tom Walker, Senior Associate Barrister at Blake Morgan, and Mary White, who is the head of the Brexit unit for the National Standards Authority of Ireland. If I can now hand over to you, Mary, to start us off today. Uh, thank you. I just... Okay, good afternoon everyone and um, thank you very much Anne for um, inviting me to speak today. So NSCI is Ireland's national standards body and we are members of three European standards organisations, SEN, uh, Senelec and Etsy and also we are members of the international standards body called ISO and I, I, IEC. So, so too are the British Standards Institute in the UK. We have a certification division and are a notified body for construction products, medical devices and non-automatic weighing machines. And we also certify companies for the suite of ISO management standards such as ISO 9001. Now today I want to give you an insight as to what is involved in product regulatory requirements, the changes that have taken place since the beginning of January and the implications for the supply chain when trading with the UK. But CE marking is a legal requirement for placing products on the EU market to demonstrate that they conform to the relevant EU directive and regulation regarding health and safety. I want to focus on the changes that have taken place since the 1st of January and what adjustments you may now have to make. I may not have all the answers to your questions in the chat, but you can send an email into the Brexit unit and we will come back to you. Now, the transition period. I, are you seeing my slides there? Uh, yes, so the transition period, uh, what has happened? Uh, the, the transition period ended um, at, at the end of December and the trade and cooperation agreement came into operation. The UK became a third country where EU law no longer applies and EU product law now applies in Great Britain rather than EU law. UK notified bodies are no longer recognised in the EU and UCAS accredited certificates are not valid for harmonised products and the protocol on Ireland and Northern Ireland has come into effect. But some uh, things have not changed. EU law still applies to products from the UK placed on the EU market. It is not where the product is manufactured, that is important, but where it is placed on the market. So the product must be CE marked, certified by an EU uh, 27 notified body if required by uh, the legislation, have a valid and up-to-date declaration of conformity or performance for construction, and where UK manufacturers uh, can continue to self-certify their product where permitted once they meet requirements of the EU legislation. It is worth noting that 80% of our products CE marked are self-certified. Now, in the Irish domestic legislation, Irish building regulations will still apply to any UK manufactured products used in a construction products. Now, in terms of Northern Ireland, the protocol for Ireland and Northern Ireland, the Good Friday Agreement North-South Cooperation uh, is protected on the all-island economy and this has been applied since the 1st of January. It avoids the need for a hard border on the island of Ireland and it protects Ireland's place in the EU single market and customs union. Most of the changes apply to trade with GB 
uh, do not apply to trade in Northern Ireland. So EU product legislation will continue to apply in Northern Ireland. And uh, it means that goods moving to and from Northern Ireland will largely do so with no significant change. Now, this is how the EU system works. First of all, we have regulations or directives, and they, the, the EU drafts these, uh, these uh, regulations and directives, which break down barriers to trade to facilitate the free movement of products to, uh, on the market. But the obligations and responsibilities are with the manufacturers, importers and distributors. So standards and technical specification show how you meet these requirements and, harm, and these, there, these are required for harmonized standards are mandatory and technical specifications are voluntary. So technical specifications will be very much used in the construction sector. Then uh, we need third party certification. And this demonstrates that your product meets the requirement of the regulation directive where required. And there's an agreed framework within the EU uh, for notify bodies. And finally, you the manufacturer, you then once the declaration of conform uh, conformity has been drawn up, the manufacturer then can affix the CE marking to the product. And the CE marking enables a product to be placed legally on the market in an EU member state and then be traded in the EU's single market. And finally, we must have market surveillance. So uh, market surveillance checks out to ensure that products placed on the market comply with the requirements of the regulation and directive. Now, there are five overarching pieces of EU legislation for placing products on the market. And there is legislation for specific products. But Directive 2001, which is the General Product Safety Directive, applies to all products where there are no specific provisions for other EU legislation with the same objective. Regulation 765 is a fairly important one in terms of accreditation and market surveillance because it lays down common rules for accrediting bodies that ensure products in the EU conform to certain requirements. It establishes a surveillance system to guarantee a high level of safety for those products and in general their compliance with applicable requirements. But it also sets rules in regard to controls on imports from outside the EU and establishes general principles for CE marking. Now, Regulation 1025, that establishes rules with regard to the corporate cooperation between the EU, European standards bodies and national standards bodies to support union legislation. And a harmonized standard means a European standard adopted on the basis of a request made by the Commission for the application of union harmonization legislation. And finally, Regulation 768 refers to market surveillance and compliance of products and 2019-1020 aims to improve how the free movement of good principles work by strengthening market surveillance. So here we've got regulations and directives. These are the EU regulations and directives. We have 10 regulations and 22 directives. The, here is a roadmap regarding the players involved and their roles. So the EU have established a NANDO database for all EU-based notified bodies, and there are currently approximately 1,300 uh, notified bodies within Europe. This roadmap is for Ireland only. So in, in here, you're seeing the notified authorities in Ireland, HPRA for medical devices, DETE, uh, Comreg look after electrical, and Department of Housing look after construction um, products. Then we have Ireland's national accreditation body, which is the Irish National Accreditation Board, known as INAB, and they provide accreditation to applicant conformity assessment bodies, known as notify bodies, that test, certify, and inspect product ser services. So they are equivalent in the UK to UCAS. And here are the list of Irish notified bodies in Ireland. In 2018, we had three, we now have 16. And here are the list of market surveillance authorities in Ireland. Now I want to bring your attention to what we mean by economic operators. So an economic operator is a manufacturer, importer, distributor, and authorized representative. So this table is summarizing the main responsibilities of economic operators. It shows the differences in responsibility. So here we go with the manufacturer. You see the manufacturer is responsible for the conformity mark and the CE mark. He must keep the documentation for 10 years. As you can see here for importers, 
they must be satisfied that the manufacturer has done all that is required. And that's one of the biggest changes that has taken place uh, since January 21, because a lot of people were distributors in Ireland and they've now become importers. So you see, uh, as an importer, you must keep the documentation for 10 years and you must um, monitor the product on the market where appropriate. So in terms of the new legal UK legal framework, the UK put in place a new legal framework for product certification whereby UK legislation replaced EU legislation. It applies to products placed on the Great Britain market, that is England, Scotland and Wales. It does not apply to the Northern Ireland market. So UK product legislation effectively transposed EU product legislation into UK law. So many of the details are similar. The UK mark replaces the CE mark. UK approved bodies replace EU notified bodies. UK designated standards replace EU harmonized standards. EU declaration of conformity replaces EU declaration of conformities. And UK customers of EU manufacturers will become importers under UK law. So, uh, to summarise, post-Brexit changes for Great Britain. We have designated standards, approved bodies and UKCA. So, I am just going to introduce you to a mark that may be used to place products on the Northern Ireland market. Now, Sid, in his talk, will talk about this in more detail in his paper. So, Article 7 of the Northern Ireland Protocol on Ireland and Northern Ireland includes provision for manufacturers who do not want to CE mark the products for the EU, but who still want to sell in Northern Ireland. They are the normal EU product certification marks with a UK NI or United Kingdom indication added. To get the mark, products must meet uh, the requirements of the EU product legislation, including using harmonized standards where required. They will be certified by UK notified bodies who will be recognized on the Nando website for Northern Ireland only, and you can certify for the Northern Ireland market. And currently there are four Northern Ireland notified bodies. They must be marked with the CE mark and the Northern Ireland indicator. So any products bearing the new mark cannot be placed on the EU market, including Ireland. Uh, and you do not need to use this if, you produce, if your products are CE marked for the EU market. So what are the post changes then for Northern Ireland? Well, I mentioned Regulation 765. So there's the introduction of the UKCA mark, the CEUK and I mark, and then in Northern Ireland, you uh, adhere to Regulation 765, whereas in the UK, they are using UCAF draft statutory instrument for product and safety metrology. So they are the major changes there in terms of legislation. So the UK acceptance of the CE mark. Well, while UK products legislation has applied since the 1st of January, the UK put in place a transition period up to the end of 2021, during which CE marked products can still be placed on the Great Britain market. They must have a valid EU declaration of conformity, be certified by a notified body to EU harmonised standards where equivalent, where required by EU law. And once the UK transition period ends, CE mark products will no longer be accepted for the Great Britain market. Now, more details here on the UCAS website. What is different for medical devices are, is that all CE marking will be valid until the 30th of June, 2023. UKCA marking are as valid from January and UKC marking will be mandatory from the 1st of July, 2023. Legislation that will apply in Great Britain will be the UK Medical Devices Regulation of 2003. And these are the three directives that the UK will be working to. And UK approved body must be used. Now, the MDR, which is the Medical Device Regulation, and IVDR will not apply in Great Britain. This is a new regulation that is coming into force on the 26th of May. But in Northern Ireland, uh, the MDR and IVDR EDR will apply there and the, 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 uh, the MHRA will be the designating authority for the North of Ireland and that is a significant regulatory divergence. So the roles and responsibilities for the UK conformity assessment, the notifying authorities would be the UCAS or MHRA, 
the uh, UCAS is the accreditation body. And in terms of medical devices, these are the three approved UK bodies for medical devices. Here are the listing of no, uh, UK approved bodies, which are also in Ireland. And in terms of uh, construction products, you can also be, uh, get your assessment through the BRE under the technical assessment boards as well as FM approvals and here are some market surveillance authorities but I do know I'm just touching lightly but I'm just showing showing you how the structure uh, uh, exists. Now in my talk today has focused on what you need to know about CE marking products if you're a manufacturer, importer and distributor. So Regulations and, dire uh, and directives continue to apply unchanged in the EU, so you'll still use uh, the EU, EU mark or CE mark um, for specific pieces of legislation where required. Uh, the protocol on Northern Ireland means that you can continue to use the CE mark in Northern Ireland and uh, also the CE UK and I mark. However, in Great Britain, uh, the C, uh, you must adhere to UK legislation and the UK CA mark should be used, but there is a transition period and during this period you can still use your CE mark. However, from the 1st of January, the CE mark will no longer be recognised in Great Britain. So, in terms of the supply chain, these are the economic operators and I'm introducing authorised reference here just as a reference for GB manufacturers and the responsible person for the Irish manufacturer uh, refers to for medical devices. So, in terms of economic operators exporting into GB, um, you are the manufacturer, so since January, you are now an importer going in to, uh, the UK, to GB, not Northern Ireland. The reverse is if you are importing products from GB. So, what is the role for the Irish importer? Um, well, under EU law, importers are responsible for ensuring that the manufacturer has produced the products in accordance with the re relevant legislation. And for construction products, please check Article 13 of the Construction uh, Products Regulation. You need to find out the additional responsibilities that you are taking on, and these are set out in the relevant EU legislation, and you can get guidance from this also from the blue guide, which I will refer to in later notes. You must be able to access the manufacturer's technical file. This is very important that you would have access to this, uh, this file. And um, it has been stated that the manufacturers uh, may be required at the port of entry. Uh, so it's important that market surveillance authorities uh, could have access to this. And your details must be include pack, uh, the packaging uh, with that of the manufacturer and of the importer. So this is important that you remember this as an importer, that is a change. In terms of um, impacts for Brexit, there is a very important EU notice to stakeholders for industrial products that was produced by the EU in March 2020. And it states that the general principles after the 31st of December. So all economic operators must comply with their obligations under this famous regulation 765. Um, both authorised representatives and importers must be established in the EU 27. The Commission is advising that British standards can no longer be used for product certification when the relevant EU legislation mandates the use of a harmonised European standard. And when a harmonised European standards are not mandated, manufacturers should follow the requirements set out in the relevant EU product legislation. Now, British standards are likely to be acceptable where the regulation allows for the use of international standards, European standards or national standards from third countries. The UK Accreditation Service has ceased to be a national accreditation body within the meaning of Regulation 765. And as I said earlier, 167 notified bodies lost their status as EU notified bodies on the 31st of uh, December. And it would constitute a form of non-compliance if you refer to a BSEN on a declaration of conformity or performance or CE marking if the product has been placed on the EU market. Um, so, nearly there. Um, so, the company in Great Britain producing the products is still defined as a manufacturer under EU law. Their customer in Ireland will become an importer and take on the additional run responsibilities, but anyone they sell onto will still be a distributor. So, just remember that. 
So this is something that you may or may not be familiar about. It's in relation to wood packaging materials. So wood packaging materials includes pallets, crates, donage, used in international trade. And there was a regulation brought in in 2006, which states that if you have your product on a pallet, it must have this ISPM mark. And um, it applies for both imports and exports. It does not apply to Northern Ireland, and it will be the, the consignment will be stopped at customs if the revenue do not see the stamp on the product. Um, here is just a quick reference to uh, revenue inquiries helplines and point of contact. So you need exporting information EXS for exporting, and you need um, ENS entry summary declaration. Uh, and more information on that from the revenue commissioners. And here are we have some frequently asked questions on NSAI's website. We're currently updating our electrical equipment. Department of Housing are very good, frequently asked questions, 17 questions on their site. And we also have webinars. So if you want to go to our website, you'll see a suite of uh, requests. And more information are referred to the blue guide on the EU website. Thank you very much. And if you have any inquiries, please send them into the Brexit unit at nsai.ie. So I think it's over to you, Tom. Mary, thank you very much. And thank you everyone for joining us for a, a tea time uh, webinar on UKCA. I um, will be sharing my screen with you shortly so that you can see my slides hopefully that works for everyone so once again i'm tom walker i'm a senior associate barrister at blake morgan i uh, practice criminal and regulatory law i prosecute for uk government agencies in particular the the health and safety executive i also regularly act and advise four companies including many irish companies uh, dealing with regulations uh, here, product safety issues, and and so on and, and so forth. So I, I have experience uh, on on both sides of the fence, so to speak, uh, compliance enforcement and and practice. And what I would like to do over the next ten minutes or so is is not so much drill down into the technical detail because you've got some fantastic technical specialists on this panel. I'm not a technical specialist. I want to give you a legal perspective to focus on the key legal issues and the key legal risks and hopefully after 10 minutes or so leave you with a, a good template for action so that you can know what your responsibilities are now at uh, this time next year and know what your your risks are so what you need to know so whistle stop tour not least because i think it's unkind um, to expect anyone to have to listen to uh, a lawyer for longer than about 10 minutes so uh, these are the uh, the five areas that we are going to uh, step over and a central point here really is i think this is a good chance for uh, for irish businesses in particular to actually use this uh, to uh, use this transition period now and a number of the advantages that the the, the irish businesses have including the, the language for a start to get a, as it were, a competitive edge. And what you should be doing now, I think, is, is focusing on the existing regime. Because as Mary has said, um, in, in, in Britain, we've heard transition period after transition period. We're still in another transition period where you can still use the CE mark uh, until 1st of January 2022, 20, uh, uh, a bit longer for some other products, but generally that's the cutoff uh, point. So, it follows then that actually you need to revisit the CE regime and just make sure that actually you've got your house in order now so that you can check your compliance, check where you are in the supply chain and project all of those uh, responsibilities and issues onto the new compliance regime uh, in good time for when it comes into, in, in, into force. So let's just have a look at the, the CE regime uh, at, at, at the moment. Well, Mary's covered uh, uh, harmonised standards and, and, and the importance uh, of, of identifying those, those standards. Those harmonised standards will be referred to as designated standards in, in UK provisions. 
And one important point to bear in mind is that, in actual fact, much EU law has been uh, transplanted into the UK. So we still follow uh, EU law uh, in, in essence. Uh, it's just that, that it now comes uh, from uh, the UK Parliament through local uh, national regulations enforced directly. But bear in mind, until a few weeks ago, the UK enforcement authorities, the market surveillance authorities, were EU regulators. So this is uh, very new terrain for, uh, for, for everyone. But let's start with uh, the compliance regime. There's a number of things that you should be doing anyway. Firstly, identifying the right standards. What standards should you be applying to your products? Uh, what guidance should you be taking into account? Should you be doing a mandatory conformity assessment with a, with a notified body at the moment, or can you, can you self-declare? And let's just look at the example of PPE, personal protective equipment, uh, prominent at the moment due, to, due to, to COVID. If we take that example, there are common issues at the moment in the UK with compliance of, of PPE. It's categorised uh, in a particular way, a spectrum of risk. So you have category one, uh, two and three PPE. Uh, often it's wrongly categorised by the manufacturer. And uh, it's important to go back and just double check that the product that you're supplying is uh, correctly categorised and accordingly uh, ha it, it is, is verified and tested to the appropriate standard. For example, lower risk product can be self-declared as, 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 as in conformity and, and CE marked uh, accordingly. Uh, in other cases, higher risk products need to, uh, to be subject to a different regime. So a good opportunity just to check that your house uh, is in order right now. Now, uh, the other point, just using the PPE example, a common problem is uh, businesses not identifying where they are in the supply chain. If you are a manufacturer, you have uh, overall responsibility for the compliance of the product. You cannot delegate that. If you are an importer, you've got heightened responsibilities. Uh, further down the chain, distributor. If you're distributing the product already, you also have responsibilities, but it's, it's one of due care. It's a, a lower responsibility, but still important. Many businesses get this wrong. They don't realize where they are in the supply chain. They think that they're the distributor. Actually, they're, imp they're the importer, and therefore they're, they're they're complying with the wrong, uh, the wrong duties. Another point to bear in mind is if you brand your own product to any extent, uh, so for example, you, you, you get PPE, for example, from a, a third party and then brand it in your own company name, in effect, in, in most cases, you will become the manufacturer and assume those responsibilities. So I would say, let's go back to basics and, and, and start to look at where you are in the supply chain and are you compliant now? Where can it go wrong? Well, I've already covered some of these points uh, and uh, you get this, this common issue, supply chain role error, I, I, I call it. But the, the other uh, uh, issue that creeps in is responsibility gaps. You get people relying on the wrong information. They're applying the wrong standards uh, or the wrong type of test uh, uh, or, or the test has been updated and it's broadly right, but not, not, not quite. And uh, you see this routinely. Another issue to watch out for is, is flawed and occasionally fake tests in, in a more extreme situation. So uh, an underlying principle here is one of monitoring and, and market surveillance, which is a, a responsibility that, uh, that manufacturers in particular have at the moment. So uh, I would say that there's... there's um, never a bad time just to review one's processes and double check and monitor the tests that you've got uh, just for that, uh, for that assurance to, to iron out uh, issues. But we're in a dynamic environment and uh, particularly at, at the moment, there have been some, uh, we could say some uh, real fails as it were in terms of product compliance because of, of, of national issues, particularly with all the, the, the legal dynamism and confusion uh, surrounding, surrounding Brexit. But in particular, uh, you can find, just using the PPE example uh, again, uh, a whole range of products currently available for sale 
um, in the UK that do not actually comply with the standard. So there are CE marked PPE products out there which are uh, non-compliant non and which our regulators are aware of. They don't necessarily pose a risk to safety, but they are technically non-compliant. I mention that because you need to be aware of the legal context and uh, compliance failures are enforced by criminal regulations. So if you get this wrong, your business and in more extreme cases, individuals within the business can be prosecuted. Now that, that is reserved for the more extreme scenarios, but you need to be aware that that is a possibility. Stepping stones along the way could be, for example, if you're aware of a non-compliance, particularly where there's a risk to consumers, you will have to notify the authority uh, in, in the UK. So if, 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 if you become aware of some non-compliance issue in a particular area, um, then you'll have to check the regulations and, and, and make sure that you're complying with notification responsibilities. You in turn might be served with notices by, by a regulator. This could be a local authority trading standards body. They may serve you with a compliance notice saying this is non-compliant, you've got until X date to sort it out. They could, even worse, they could serve you with a withdrawal notice and say you've got to take this product away from your, uh, your immediate customer. Or a little bit more doomsday and for the more extreme scenarios, a recall notice where they actually uh, require you to recall the product from your, your end users. And, and no one really wants to go down uh, that route. Uh, it's costly. Uh, insurance um, uh, policies don't always respond to these types of issues. And just a word on that, uh, always a good opportunity to check your product liability insurance uh, 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 on issues such as, such as this, but also reputational issues. And, and really compliance, uh, I would say, is, is something that you should use uh, commercially. You should market yourselves as a, as a compliant business. That's, that's what consumers want, particularly uh, with more sophisticated products. Bear in mind, of course, that in, in, in the, the worst case scenario, a criminal prosecution uh, for a compliance failure, and if convicted, you can face an unlimited fine, which, which now increasingly is linked not to the prof profitability of the business, but to the turnover, so the fines can be can be very very high indeed. So just a, a word on on uh, the new marking. Uh, Mary's already covered this, but bear in mind that UKCA is not recognised on on the EU market. Distinct legal regimes. This is the irony, though, that uh, many of us uh, in the UK feel that the the Office for Product Safety and Standards has, has said that actually product safety law is not going to change dramatically within the UK. So you have this, this irony that after all this um, uh, uh, tugging and, 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 and debate, uh, actually the technical standards are not necessarily going to diverge significantly, at least in the short term. Um, but you, you do need to watch this space because they may do. And if, they, if the technical standards do diverge, you are going to have to get different tests done, not just by different bodies, but different different tests. So a word on Northern Ireland. Um, Sid is going to be covering this uh, uh, shortly, uh, so I won't get into the technical detail, but I'm, I'm mentioning this because I'm asking everyone uh, to, to go back to basics as it were. And inevitably, if you're supplying um, uh, into Northern Ireland um, or sourcing from Northern Ireland, uh, you, you just need to have Northern Ireland in your mind because Northern Ireland is, is effectively like a, a, a valve and products can move uh, uh, one way, uh, so from Northern Ireland into GB in certain circumstances and, and, and the other way round, but there are impediments. So it's not completely uh, 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 free movement per se. Northern Ireland is effectively still within the EU in, in terms of the single, uh, the single market and is required to comply with with EU legislation. Uh, the unfettered access provisions in terms of Northern Ireland uh, to GB only apply to certain types of goods. So it's called qualifying goods and that there are separate regulations on this. That's goods uh, uh, that are already present in Northern Ireland or processed in Northern Ireland. Um, now, uh, that is to stop Northern Ireland being, being used um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a back route in to into GB for EU products. 
Um, I, I'm sure there will be some litigation around this, um, this, this provision in, in due course. But all I would say in simple terms is if Northern Ireland is in your supply chain, you need to take stock and, and work out what that, uh, what that means and, and, and the do's and don'ts. So uh, here we are, the, the action template. And I think it's very easy to get lost and perhaps overwhelmed in the detail because it's, let's face it, it's quite dry. And if you focus too much on the detail and then think about different products and different sectors, then you can lose sight of some of the simple spreadsheet type operations, flowchart type operations that uh, you, you would benefit, uh, or certainly from, from doing now. And I say that because I act for, for startup businesses uh, as well as some very well established businesses, and I've yet to encounter a single one that hasn't found. Uh, this type of back to basics exercise, a monitoring exercise, uh, 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 useful uh, 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 at some point. So what I would say is, pair it all back. What, what's your sector? Who are the associations? Uh, who can you mine for information? Who can you buddy up with? Uh, stay on top uh, of, of that. Um, go to um, uh, to technical specialists. Uh, Mary's organization and, and, and some of the fantastic publications that, that, that they have, very useful in fact, uh, and sector specific. And then work through to your standards. What are your standards? How are they changing? Have they been updated? Do you need any further technical advice? And then know your regulator. Who regulates your product in the, uh, the nation you're supplying to? So, so who is your UK regulator? Check their website, look at their timetable. And also, don't just think about UKCA because this opens up a smorgasbord, as it were, of other uh, types of changes. There are other things that you might need to get on top of. So there are discrete timetables for different products. Medical devices, as we've already heard, has a slightly different timetable. Generally, we're looking at 1st of Jan 22 uh, for UKCA markings. In some cases, though, machinery and, um, and, and PPE, you can have the UKCA mark. Uh, on, on packaging available with a product until the 31st of December, uh, 2022. But again, I would say, look to your regulator, look to the timetables that they refer to, and look for other provisions. Are there any other things you need to look out for? Authorized representatives, for example. Is there a time, to, well, there is a timetable there that you need to, need to look at, um, because if you, if you want an authorized representative to supply machinery into the UK, for example, to GB, you uh, you need to appoint one sooner rather than later because that provision is in force. And finally, reflect on your place and role in the supply chain. Are you a distributor? Are you an importer? That will change because of Brexit. Does Northern Ireland fit into this jigsaw? And once you've worked this out, you've done that checklist, you've, you've, you've looked at your products, your standards, I would say, I would hope that you know your responsibilities, that you know your risks, and you are as ready as anyone for UKCA uh, when it comes into force properly uh, next year. So finally, I would say thank you very much for, for listening and happy, happy trading. I will now hand over to Kevin. Thank you very much, Tom, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I will just get my slideshow showing on the screen just bear with me okay so hopefully you're, you're now seeing uh, the UCAS presentation um, and just by way of introduction so again my name is Kevin Belson and I'm the technical manager at the UK national accreditation body which is UCAS um, and what I wanted to do today was just talk about the role of, of the world of accreditation and specifically about the conformity assessment bodies that get involved in approving product, um, assessing product and, and monitoring product. By way of background, as I, as I mentioned, UCAS is, is appointed by UK government, specifically by uh, Bayes government department, as being the UK's conformity assessment body. All 
European countries and many, many world countries also have approved, appointed uh, bodies like this. We work very closely with all of them, including, I'm very pleased to say, we work extremely closely with our neighbour, the INAB, the Irish National Accreditation Body. So we're an appointed body. We are full members of a number of, of organisations, which can be very important in this kind of discussion. Um, we're members of something that is called the European Cooperation for Accreditation as well as members of some wider worldwide groups, the International Accreditation Forum and the International Laboratory Accreditation Cooperation. Excuse me, that one's a little bit of a mouthful. Um, and the reason this is so important, including the, the EA part of this, is that these organizations are founded on a principle of mutual recognition, which means that you can have confidence in product or processes or services being produced and delivered from different parts of the world within this umbrella of accreditation. So the concept is that an ISO 9000 certificate published in, in Ireland holds the same status as an ISO 9000 certificate published in the UK, in Spain, in France, wherever it may be. And, and that mutual recognition is, is very important in ensuring that the requirements for conformity assessment are being looked at in the same or certainly extremely similar ways across Europe when we're talking about product compliance. But the primary role with regard to this particular uh, web presentation today of UCAS as well as the other European accreditation bodies now in a slightly different way is our role in the accreditation and approval and the monitoring of what were notified bodies, but are now known as approved bodies within the UKCA system. The reason the name changes is really because of the fact that in leaving the European Union, we have pulled away from the European regulations that have already been mentioned this afternoon, Regulation 765 in particular, and, and Decision 768, which are the important ones. And, and the core line that I've extracted from, from those regulations is a statement that says that in the European system, a notified body must be established in an EU member state. It's an interesting term, that one, established, as to what it exactly means. But it essentially means that if we're not in the EU, the notified bodies in the UK are not established in an EU member state and therefore can really no longer be considered notified bodies in, in terms of, of the European Commission and the European Union. Union. Um, so... In the UK, as you now know, those notified bodies are now moving over and are now known as approved bodies under the UKCA system. And we'll talk a I'll talk a little bit more about that as to what that means, what they have to be able to do, what we look at with them. I won't go into detail on the, the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, you've heard that already, and I know there's more specific discussion on that still to come. But from a UK, from a UCAS perspective, from an accreditation perspective, what you'll see is that the requirements for that accreditation, the things that we go and look at these organisations for, the kind of things that we test when we go and visit them, are pretty well along the same lines. And, and that's because the UK processes are built upon well-established and well-proven processes within EA and within the wider world of, of notified bodies. The important uh, split, I think, to make here with regard to the role of the accreditation body is, is that UCAS do not appoint an approved body. That is part of a legal system and, it, and it's the role of the government. So UK government makes the actual appointment or approval of an approved body for, for UKCA. We accredit them as part of that process, but actually it's a very large part of that process because normally the UK uh, competent authority, the government body, 
will take that accreditation and use that as the core of their appointment of that body of the UKCA body. Um, so it's it's a very big chunk of it. The BASE, which is the, the primary um, UK authority with responsibility for this activity, publish some very useful guidance. Uh, you'll see on my slide presentation, there's some links to that guidance that you might find very useful. But what we have been doing with the input from Bayes and the other authorities is the, the notified bodies as they were, were transferred over the Christmas period effectively so that on January the 1st this year they were approved bodies. It's a straightforward process to transfer them, largely because the competencies that they have to be able to demonstrate as a UK approved body are pretty well identical to the competencies as a European notified body. We're still going to be working to the same overall regulations and directives. We're still going to be working to the same harmonised standards within those directives. And so it's, it's fairly straightforward to move them uh, across from one to the other. Nando database was mentioned earlier on. Nando is the, the European database for approved bodies, for notified bodies. There is now a UK called the UK MCAB database, which does the same thing within the UK area. And just to highlight as well, I mentioned the role of the government authorities. There, there, there are a number of, of government authorities or competent authorities according to which regulations and which directives we are dealing with. I've mentioned Bayes, there's also MHCLG that, that looks specifically after the construction products regulation and then Department for Transport as well through a, a couple of agencies dealing with some very specific regulations. So as far as what approved bodies have to do and have to show, it, it's really carried over from the European document of EA217 that I believe Mary mentioned earlier on. And 217 with a, an EA document, a European policy document, defining the requirements to be a notified body from an accreditation perspective and how the accreditation body would work. And as I said before, because 217 was well established and works, UCAS's system, which is called Gen 5, was based largely on that. We carried over a lot of very similar requirements, not identical, and we may have stressed some points a little bit more than others, but it still follows the same line as 217. The accreditation are based on, on a specific set of standards that are used for accrediting conformity assessment bodies. So, for example, a very commonly used one is a standard called ISO IEC 17065, which is for conformity assessment bodies working in product and process certification. But all of the standards that fit in this group have very similar requirements, and these are the things we have to look at at the conformity assessment body, their legal status. Competence, you will appreciate, it's vital. This body is going to be examining product for safety to go onto the UK market or onto the Irish market. And so the competence is, is paramount. We also have to look very closely at their impartiality and also confidentiality, which I didn't mention here. And of course, look at the processes that they follow to actually approve a piece of equipment. So we, we have laid down criteria as well, which reflects the European criteria. So we mentioned earlier on that the regulations in Europe said that a, a notified body had to be established in a UK member state. We've taken a very similar line in cooperation with government departments, of course. We don't set the policy at UCAS, the government department does. But the, the line is that um, approved bodies that want to be UKCA bodies have to be established under UK law and have a legal personality. And we've been looking at this question of what being established means and, and we feel it's important that it's seen as not just being a registered company in Company's House in the UK, having a registration name 
and a plate on a door. It isn't a brass plate. It's about having an actual working entity in the UK with that legal, in, legal identification. And this becomes important because we have not surprisingly, and, and, and I don't think you'll be too surprised, um, a lot of applications coming in from European notified bodies in other European countries wanting to be approved for UKCA assessments. And we've had to be clear right from the start that we will only accredit for UKCA a UK legal entity. So some of these bodies are moving forward. They're going to be setting up their own legal entity in the UK and we're laying down some quite strict rules about what it means to be that UK legal entity. It isn't just a case of relying totally on, on their other site in another country. There is one exception to this that, that it's worth mentioning now. There may be people here involved in this, um, but there's one particular directive called the Pyrotechnic Articles Directive. Um, pyrotechnic articles being fireworks but also importantly being things like airbags in motor vehicles and things like that so it's quite an important directive but what was realized was that, that after the split from from Europe there was no qualified notified body for pyrotechnic articles in the UK the reliance had been in notified bodies from other European countries and so because of this lack of, of organization and the need to have one the rules have been relaxed a little bit for european notified bodies being approved to be ukca pyrotechnic bodies in that they don't have to have a uk office or a uk site but it's just for that one directive so as far as the process and rules are um, the process is the same as the CE marking. The, the rules are all based on the standards harmonized to the regulation. So the product standard normally will have an annex. It's often called Annex ZA. Um, so it's always found at the back of the document. And that annex will identify what kind of conformity assessment is needed for the product concerned. And that's based on the importance of the product in terms of safety, it's termed on its expected use uh, and can range from design reviews being necessary by a third party to a full type approval, which means the third party inspecting examples of the product, looking at the factory production control and all of those things, or in some cases, a self-declaration. And, and that's what drives the process. That defines what it is that an approved body is going to have to do for that particular product. So I'm sorry this is a very quick 10 minute presentation. We're a bit limited for time on this. There are some links at the end of my presentation. If people have specific questions about the role of, of the approved bodies and um, about the role of accreditation in this, I'm more than happy to, to take questions uh, either in the question section at the end of this or directly afterwards after the meeting. So thank you very much indeed. I hope you found that of some interest. And uh, I'm going to hand over now to Sidan. Hello there, everyone. This is Sidan, also known as Sid. Today I'm here on behalf of Enterprise Ireland and Compliance and Risk to shed some light on the new marking requirements for Dawn of the Ireland. Just a, quick, just a quick background of what we do. Compliance and Risk is headquartered in Cork, Ireland, also known as the Rebel County, which is where I'm speaking to you all from. We provide a business advantage for clients by providing reliable legislative information, insights and actions through C2P its knowledge management platform and other solutions. We provide updates on laws right from the proposal stage to the enactment stage so that you as a manufacturer or a concerned party can provide your opinion and views to the legislators, enabling you to perhaps map the legislation side by side with the governments. This is what I would be covering in the next 10 minutes or so. 
It's a nice sunny evening here in Cork, so let's get started. First question which you might think of is, what is the need for it? Well, this obligation arises out of the Northern Ireland Protocol, which came into force on 1st January 2021. The UK NI marking basically proves that the manufactured goods placed on the market in Northern Ireland are aligned with all the relevant EU rules regarding product safety. These are the vast product areas which fall under UK NI marking. Now bear in mind that there are products covered by the UK NI marking which have some special rules, such as medical devices, rail interoperability, and civil explosives. Firstly, a key difference here between the UK CA and UK NI marking is that a product with both the CE and UK CA markings can be placed on the EU market, as my co-presenters have said before. However, for the EU market, the CE mark must appear without the UK NI indication as goods bearing the CE and UK NI marking are not acceptable in the EU market. Secondly, you never apply the UK NI marking on its own. It always accompanies the CE mark. Just a chart of what I explained earlier. You never use the UK NI marking on its own. It's always accompanied by the CE mark. This chart is just a handy representation in case you're looking back at this presentation. Sometimes the product is too small, so it might get tricky to fix the UK and I mark. So if you reduce or enlarge the size of your marking, the letters forming the UK and I mark must be in proportion to the version set out here. On 12th February, the UK Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy offered some further clarity, saying that the 5mm rule applies in height for the whole logo, not individual letters, unless a different minimum dimension is specified in the relevant legislation. Now, the main statutory instrument which enacted the UKNI marking is Product Safety and Metrology UKNI Indication Regulation SI 2020-1460. These are some guidance documents which can be of assistance while placing goods on the Northern Ireland market. Now, kindly note that this is not an exhaustive list. There are more product specific guidance documents. You can of course get in touch with me if you would like further guidance on any specific product area which we might be able to help you with. Now, these questions have been causing some confusion amongst our clients. So I would like to stress on something which I explained earlier in slide six. One of the key differences between the UK CA and UK NI mark is that a product with both the CE and UK CA markings can be placed on the EU market. However, for the EU market, the CE mark must appear without the UK NI indication, as goods bearing the CE and UK NI marking are not acceptable in the EU market because these goods must be manufactured to EU rules and cannot be assessed by a body based in the UK. So that's it from me. Thanks for tuning in. I love making new friends. So if you'd like to talk about anything, do give me a shout by email. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sid. And um, thank you for your presentations. That was very informative and hopefully has given businesses more information on what they need to do to prepare for the UK CA more. So if I could now put uh, some questions, uh, some scenarios to our panelists on um, different issues that may impact uh, a, very, a variety of different industries. Um, while we all just come on. Um, so if I can start with, um, say, the agricultural industry, um, what would be the requirements uh, for Irish manufacturers placing machinery into the UK after the 1st of January, 2022? Could you answer that? For me, Tom, if I can start with you. Uh, Tom, you're on mute. 
Sorry, I, that, that, you know, yeah. that's the expression of the year, isn't it? You're on mute. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, uh, yes, I, I can try and answer that. So, um, firstly, you need to check whether your machinery is subject to a harmonised standard and which regulations it falls under. Uh, agricultural machinery uh, is likely to fall under the supply of machinery regs, uh, 2008, uh, the UK regulations, but there are some exemptions. Uh, tractors, I'm fairly sure, are uh, don't fall within uh, that, that regulation. Um, but before you go off and place uh, tens of thousands of unmarked tractors on the GB uh, UK market, that would have to be checked. So uh, what I'm saying is, is check uh, the specific machinery you've got, check which standards uh, a, a, a apply, which harmonised standards, check the regulations that apply, whether there are any uh, exemptions. But it is likely that the supply machinery regs will apply, and that will mean that from the 1st of January 22, the product has to be uh, UK conformity assessed by a UK approved body with a caveat that, um, and again, this would need to be uh, specifically considered. In certain circumstances, you, you should be allowed as a sort of a, 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 a teething transition to have the UK CA mark on accompanying uh, package. What I would say there commercially is why do that if you can just hit the nail on the head first time around and get it on the, 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 the product, but you, you can bear in mind there is that stepping stone uh, to, to, to compliance. So um, that's what I would say that you need to be aware of. I hope that helps. Yeah, okay, thanks. Um, and then moving to the, 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 the healthcare sector, um, how would Northern Ireland entities who are registering their organizations and CE mark devices with medicines and healthcare products regulatory agency, how would that be facilitated? facilitated? Sedant. Hi, so, and yeah, under the terms of the Northern Ireland protocol, the rules for placing medical devices on Northern Ireland market differ from those applicable to Great Britain, that is England, Wales, and Scotland. There is a requirement in most cases to register devices with the MHRA, and some key requirements for placing a device on the Northern Ireland market, the CE marking is required. In addition, the UK and I marking is required if a UK notified body undertakes mandatory third party conformity assessment. Uh, as yes, of course, uh, Mary, Mary said previously in her presentation, the EU MDR and EU IVDR will apply in Northern Ireland from 26 May 2021 and 26 May 2022, respectively. Uh, also, when placing devices on the Northern Ireland market, GB-based manufacturers must appoint an EU or Northern Ireland-based authorized rep. Of course, you can find the detailed guidance on the UK government website by MHRA. Thanks. Okay, thanks. And for non-medical companies that are selling into the UK health sector, and say these companies have sourced their products from China, they then moved it into Great Britain, so that would be Scotland, England, or Wales, and then brought it across to the Republic of Ireland, and then moved it up into Northern Ireland, and say they're, they're acting as the marketed manufacturer. How does the UKCA mark impact on them? Is that maybe one for you, Mary? Um, well, it, it, originally the product is coming from a third country, and the product is going to be, from what I could uh, understand your question there, Anne, is that the product is going to final, its final destination will be in Northern Ireland. So the rule that applies uh, are where the product is placed on the market, not where it's manufactured. And uh, as these products are destined for Northern Ireland, then they'd have to comply with the EU rules and regulations for placing the products on the Northern Ireland market when they are delivered to Northern Ireland. And they will therefore need to be uh, CE marked uh, or uh, if required by EU legislation or CE UK and I marked if the protocol applies. Okay, um, moving on to the construction sector, um, using the construction sector as a, as a scenario, how does the UK CA mark affect 
existing UK subcontracts midterm that then spans the changeover date where suppliers have then got to commence with the UK with the sorry the CE mark. So they're they're working on CE product at the minute, transporting it into uh, Great Britain, and then they've got to quickly come over to the uh, the UK CA mark. How would that impact on them? Mary, can I get you to cover that one? No problem. Um, well, I think they, they need to check what contract uh, says in terms of uh, the product certification and who is re responsible in the first instance for compliance uh, with regulatory requirements. So there's no problem at all in 2021 as the CE mark products can still be placed on the GB market. But there would be an issue for 2022 as only the UK CA mark products can be placed on the GB market. So someone will have to take responsibility for getting those products certified in accordance then with the UK legislation and the UK uh, CA uh, marking. So basically if they're looking at manufacturing something now to move over in January 2022 they actually need to put all the ducks in a row to get the UK CA. Yes and that all uh, takes time it's not something that you can say I'll get this done in a month's time. Uh, I think uh, Kevin might be able to say how long it may take you know, like, if, well, Kevin mind because he's the notified body, but if you're the approved body in the UK, um, they they all have their own timescales. So if you were yeah. to equate it to the medtech sector, it'll take maybe longer. It all depends on the sector. Um, and, as, and if you apply to get it towards the end of the year, there might be a queue of people trying to switch over. So my advice, yeah. like what Tom had said earlier, is plan, plan, and plan do, you know, uh, the, the 9001 is uh, plan, plan do check act so just plan out okay. can i may i add to that if that's okay yes, just, just, just it, a thought Kevin. and yeah the, the, obviously there the could be concerns over capacity with, with a lot of changes but we have the year to do it but it's worth saying that all the way through the process and, and the planning UK government have tried to take a very pragmatic approach and, and that will continue and so in many cases it could well be possible for the UKCA approved body to take full account of work that's been done to gain the CE approval beforehand. It doesn't necessarily mean that every test has got to be redone that every inspection has got to be redone. I have to put a proviso in there and say that there is one stick here point on that one within construction products which is when we're talking about a system three product for which policy is still being defined but in in more general terms it should be perfectly feasible for UKCA process to build on what's been done before okay thanks thanks Kevin um so we can then sort of think about the industrial sector say the Euro auto energy and if it's an EU um, company, um, Irish company, who buys raw materials from UK, Great Britain stockists, they such as steel or plastic, they then process it in Ireland into a sub-supply component, but, but it's not the end product, and then they ship it back to the UK. Do they need to worry about the CE, UK, CA mark changes? Tom, can you take that? Yes. Um, again, I, I can I, I can try and give a, a, an overview because this is a complicated area. And what I'd say here, this really goes to why I'd say you need to be sector specific, and you really need to look at precisely your role in the supply chain, what uh, product you're, uh, you're 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 importing, what you're processing, and 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 what you're manufacturing and sending back. It may be that um, if, for example, the, the harmonised standards don't apply, the CE provisions don't apply, then actually the UKCA provisions aren't going to apply. So these markings don't apply to every single product. Not every product requires uh, conformity assessment. So that's why I, 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 I said start by focusing on uh, the CE mark and existing EU compliance, because that still is. Uh, in, in, in effect, in practical terms, the, the, the system here. So uh, I, I would say you have to uh, specifically check the, the sector and the standards and, 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 and what's, what's 
uh, in application here. But um, one other important point is, as I said, UKCA is not the only change to, to legislation affecting the regulation of products. And for these sorts of processing type operations, you also need to consider uh, REACH, which is, is, is now in effect UK REACH or GB REACH, um, and um, CLP. So these are um, pr uh, uh, provisions which apply to the, the control of, of chemicals and, and substances and also classification, labelling and, and packaging. And you need to be aware that some of your products, even if they fall uh, out with the UKCA regime, may fall within the REACH and CLP re uh, regime, which has, has, um, has also altered within GB. Technically, for present purposes, it's basically the same, but you need to be aware that that's another regulatory um, di divergence to be aware of. Okay, thanks. Um, so moving back to the construction industry again, I, mean, I know a large amount of steel for the construction industry is purchased in GB and it's brought back to Ireland and manufactured, um, say, for uh, large residential developments and exported back into GB. What would the process, uh, what would the process be that they would need to ensure um, the UKCA compliance? Um, Mary, can you answer that for me, please? Um, I think it's like a, a previous question that you asked me there on the rules that apply or where the product is placed on the market. So the raw material has come into Ireland, uh, the manufacturer in Ireland has made uh, a product and then it's been sent back to the GB market. So as these products are destined for the GB market, they will need to be complying with the rules for placing products on the GB market when they are exported back to GB. And then also to take into account, there could be duty and tax implications depending on the interpretation of the rules of origin as there will be processing in Ireland. So that piece would be sorted out by revenue. So in my slide presentation, I give links uh, to the revenue website. Um, there is also another consideration I'd like to introduce, Anne, is that what if you're an Irish manufacturer in Ireland and you're bringing in a, a steel product from the UK and you're putting it into an Irish product. So the product that may be coming in could be made to uh, what's known as um, EN 1090 and that product may have to be certified now before it comes into Ireland, if you follow me. So the manufacturer in the UK may also have to get his product uh, certified to an EU base 27 notified body in order for it to be going into the building project in Ireland. So it's very, very important too that we could be having receiving raw materials coming into Ireland that is going into a, a building project in Ireland as well. And that project also has to get signed off. So in both jurisdictions, there's going to be rules that will be required, if you follow me. So I introduced yep. uh, an amendment to your question. It's okay. Look, th thanks. That's a lot of information to digest. And it's an appropriate time to say to all the enterprise Ireland client companies who have joined us today and who export to the UK, if you need further guidance or if you have any questions about anything that was talked about today, please do contact your UK market advisor and a list of um, the UK um, market advisors and the sectors that we all cover will be displayed on the screen in just a minute. But before we move on to our audience questions, because there's a lot that's come in and I and I, I can see that we're over time, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Emer O'Byrne. Emer is a senior executive in the Brexit unit in Ent Enterprise Ireland, and she's going to give us an overview of the supports um, that's available. Emer. Thanks very much, Anne. I hope that everybody can hear me okay. And you can see the, the slide that's just been put up. So as Anne says, I work in Enterprise Ireland's Brexit unit, which is based in Dublin. So we work with Irish companies who are looking to try and identify and overcome challenges associated with Brexit, but also to work closely with our colleagues like Anne in uh, the Enterprise Ireland, London and Manchester offices uh, to highlight opportunities for Irish companies to grow in, in the UK as well. And I suppose I just wanted to highlight a few of the financial supports that are available to companies from the Irish government agencies, both Enterprise Ireland, as well as our colleagues in the local enterprise offices. You know, a few of these supports are listed on the, the slide there, as you can see. But what I would 
point and direct people to our website, which is called prepareforbrexit.com. And that lists all the supports that are available, whether it be through Enterprise Ireland or our colleagues, as I said, in, in the, the local enterprise offices, such as their customs training programs, their mentoring, and they have specific financial supports as well. And for today, I would just like to highlight two particular uh, financial supports. The first one is the Evolve Strategic Planning Grant. And this grant is uh, up to the value of €5,000 of a grant, and it's for Enterprise Ireland client companies to look at engaging an expert consultant to work with them to get advice on a broad range of areas you know for example it can support companies to look at optimizing approaches to their supply chain for example it can support companies to look at researching opportunities as the market evolves and changes and i suppose in particular for those listening today it also can help companies or support companies to access um, consultants and expertise while preparing for changes to certification and, and regulatory requirements then the other support i would also highlight is our ready for Customs uh, grant, which was launched in September of 2020 as part of a, it was a 20 million fund or a 20 million fund as part of a, a stimulus package by the Irish government. And companies can get access to up to 9,000 euro per employee for engaging someone in customs work, whether they be new or redeployed into that role. We can also support part-time positions because customs work can lend itself to, to part-time uh, roles. And it's open to companies beyond Enterprise Ireland client companies, so to, to Irish companies that are directly engaged in business activities to, from and through the UK and who require a uh, new or increased customs clearance uh, capacity. And just to give uh, kind of an example, we, over the final four months of 2020, uh, we supported up to a thousand or over a thousand customs roles uh, to the value of 7.6 uh, million. So that grant is still available, but is only available until the end of March. So companies can find out more information on our prepareforbrexit.com site, and that's also where they can apply. And we would uh, encourage companies, anybody who might be interested in either applying for one of the supports or finding out more information to contact their development advisor in Enterprise Ireland to learn more. And that's all from uh, the Enterprise Ireland support side of things. And, and unless there's any any questions. Um, we've actually got quite a lot of questions um, that's come in, and then I'm not going to keep everyone on uh, for too much longer, and sorry if I'm not going to get to all your questions, but if I very quickly go through a few. Um, one of the questions says, UCAS test reports are no longer acceptable for the purpose of CE marking. Will test reports from AU test labs be acceptable for UK CA mark? I don't know who would like to take that one. I can pick that up if you like. Please, Kevin. Um, and, and I think I have to say that the degree of it depends on this. Um, it, it, there's a difference in, in the way this is looked at between different sectors. Um, and, and generally speaking, it also depends on which module of a directive is being followed. So if a European notified body is doing a, a complete type approval for a new piece of equipment, they will gather information from a number of places to support that type approval. And as far as I'm aware, there's no reason why they shouldn't use the UCAS accredited report as part of that. And similarly, the other direction, that a UK approved body could use a European test report, but, and it's a very important but, the UK approved body has to take full ownership of that. So they can't just take a report and put it into a pack. They take a report, they make sure it's come from a suitable position, they ensure process has been followed, they ensure it's reliable and traceable before they can use it. So it's not a simple answer, that's a very quick answer to quite a complex process. Question. Yeah. Um, the only one I would say, I mentioned earlier on construction products regulation, AVCP system three, which is the testing module, there are some very specific controls there whereby it probably won't be possible for either side to use each other's test reports. It depends. Okay, thanks. Yeah. thanks. Thanks, Kevin. Um, can we put the CE and UK CA mark on one product to enable it to be sold both in Ireland and in GB? Um, Mary, if you're answering that, I think you're on mute. Okay, sorry, Anne. Uh, it's my understanding that you can have both mark, uh, marks on the product. So you can 
can have the uh, and, and you only need to do that from January 2022 for industrial products. So you can have the UK CA mark and the CE mark, uh, but you must have a declaration of conformity for both marks. So you'd have to have a UK declaration of conformity and an, a, a, an EU declaration of conformity by the manufacturer. Okay. Um, and if a piece of equipment is certified in Northern Ireland by UCAS Lab, is that recognised in the Republic of Ireland currently and more importantly in 2022? Um, well, <laughs> it, it all depends if it's uh, to harmonise standard. So a UCAS test cert, la, uh, test cert, it all depends on um, which legislation because there's a lot of UCAS test labs uh, certificates are, are perfect are, are, and should be accepted. So if it is to a harmonised standard, no. I think, Evan, would you be in agreement there? I, th I think that's a good way of putting it. It's very similar to the to the earlier question and, and it's certain directives in certain situations it may be acceptable, in others it may not. It's, it's not an easy answer. Okay. Um, when a notified body has created a legal entity with the aim to become an approved body and has implemented its ISO 17, 17065 quality system that was already audited by the competent authority in the EU, is a new audit then required by UCAS? Yes, um, it is, because now we're, we're, we're looking at other things as well so yes when a, an overseas body moves into the uk they are already experienced in what they're doing they're already accredited by another member of the european cooperation for accreditation and we will recognize that but that doesn't mean we won't do any audit it means we will concentrate more on the uk aspects and the uk requirements but we will still also still audit them technically as well but maybe not to the same degree as a brand new body we have to give some due and it's better for it's better anyway for the flow of industry that we're not delaying things by by being overly bureaucratic but at the same time we need to be robust so it's a long way of saying yes they still will be audited um, but we will, as part of the audit process, give due credence to their existing qualification. Okay, thank you. And I said I am going to make this last question because I did promise that I wasn't going to um, keep everyone too long. Um, is a DOP slash CE mark with System for Assessment declared on the DOP still acceptable from a UK manufacturer slash supplier? A system four does not require a notified body to be declared on the DOP. And I kind of, while you were um, uh, chatting, Sorry, I looked I'm, up. Could I'm, you I'm, just assuming DOP, I'm assuming DOP is direct observation of procedural skills. No, it's a declaration yeah. of performance. Oh, is it? Sorry. I presume it's so, so the question again is a DOP CE mark with system for assessment declared on the DOP still acceptable from a UK manufacturer supplier? Do you, Kevin? I'm not sure. No, I, I would have to go away and think about them. That's not something I would have an immediate answer for, I'm afraid. I need a little bit of notice. If the questioner wants to contact me directly by email, that's fine, and I'll, I'll go back to them, but I'm afraid I will need a little bit of time to look into that. Okay, well, sorry to the person who's asked uh, that sorry, question. Sorry, uh, I Kevin can just say that uh, uh, assist, uh, if it is uh, to the AVCP system for the construction products regulation, which would be similar to the UK system, there is no uh, notify not not body involvement uh, for system four. There is for uh, system three, but not system four. So That's there wouldn't be point. any involvement. Yeah. There wouldn't be any involvement by a notified body. Okay, well, hopefully then that does answer the question and they don't need to go back to Kevin. But see, we have run out of time, really run over time. Um, and apologies if we didn't get to answer all of your questions. But before we sign off today, I'd like to say a massive thank you to Mary, Tom, Kevin and Sedan for your presentations and for giving us your time today. 
And I'd also like to say a huge thank you for attending today. And if anyone has any questions, please do reach out and contact us. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.